Hi, this is Abdul Bharti and welcome to another episode of TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us Chip Childers, a CTO of Cloud Foundry. Uh, let's talk about the new announcement from Cloud Foundry. Uh, I mean, people often talk, look at Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes as something computing, but you know, uh, you know, people have been using these two technologies, you know, uh, together for a while. Uh, and Cloud Foundry has been doing a lot of work. Look, there was Kubo, then it was uh, renamed into you know CNCR or something like that, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so, so, so there is a lot of you know history there. So, so let's look at the origin of you know CubeCF. Why? What problem that the committee saw that you, you know, to work with Susie and come up with the project? I think it's important to reiterate your your point that um, there, for for years now, um, any concept that it's either the Cloud Foundry application runtime or that PaaS experience and kind of versus a Kubernetes um, you know, based experience, it just hasn't made any sense to the the enterprises that are uh, adopting both. Frankly. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's plenty of uh, of, of use cases that uh, don't fit into uh, you know path style architecture. Um, that's okay, right? If you look at the the breadth of architectures that, uh, that the typical enterprise deals with, you know, there's there's a tons of tons of applications that, um, frankly, the, if you want them in a container based architecture, you need to just wrap the thing in a container and and operate it that way. Um, and that's very different than a PaaS experience, which is optimized for the, the developer productivity, right? It, it gets rid of a lot of concerns that they uh, would otherwise have to deal with. It was, of course, originally an optimization from VM-based infrastructure, um, you know, where, where you'd have to provision the VM, then you'd have to go install your, you know, your middleware, and then you'd go about the, the code push process. So the PaaS experience that Cloud Foundry offers is about optimizing that developer time. Let them focus on business problems. Let them focus on the app they're trying to build, not on the plumbing underneath it. And Kubernetes made infrastructure more approachable, right? It, it, but it's still an infrastructure-centric platform. Um, and so it's appropriate for a lot of use cases, but it, it actually pairs really well. Now, you know, a couple of years ago, when the Cloud Foundry community started working with, with um uh, Kubernetes, and it was a, a joint project from VMware, Pivotal, and Google. Um, it was it was a way to it was it, the community was looking to solve the deployment and management of Kubernetes um, so that it could live side by side with that that PaaS experience. Um, so we have a long history, a couple years now, of of working with Kubernetes. Um, another thing that had been occurring in our ecosystem was that. As each of the different, uh, as each of the vendors was taking Cloud Foundry to market, some of them were choosing to do it um, uh, on top of earlier versions of Kubernetes, and this goes back as far as 2015. Um, the the team at um, the the team at at the time it was HPE, but then they they ended up moving to SUSE as a whole team, right? As SUSE uh, acquired some of the Helion assets from, from HPE. Um, that also meant that teams were moved over to, to SUSE. Um, they were working to take Cloud Foundry's components, um, package them into Docker containers, and then deploy them into early versions of, uh, of Kubernetes. That's how they brought it to market. So since then, if we kind of fast forward to today, all right, so what, what are all the components um, that, that we now have that are in the upstream community in, in the cloud foundry community we've got an effort um which is uh, actually at this point quite mature uh, which called was called project arini or is called project arini um, it's about allowing uh kubernetes to be a part of that cloud foundry architecture right and and eliminate the um not eliminate but to use kubernetes as an alternative as um, as the migrations occurring to the what's called the Diego based orchestration layer. Now that's a layer that was never intended to be a general purpose container orchestration tool, right? It was purpose built because Cloud Foundry's been around from you know before Docker even existed. Um, the second component that we had in the upstream uh, before KubeCF came in was an effort called Project Quarks, which kind of took some code from SUSE called Fizzle. Um, it would take uh, take the the type of release artifact that our project teams were were generally releasing um, for their component of the system, kind of work it into a usable Docker image, um, and then you'd use Helm and some scripts to kind of deploy that into Kubernetes. So what was missing was, and, and a lot of the teams, both the Arini team and the Project Quarks team, 
they were using this code that SUSE um, had, had been working on, and it's really the basis of the, the SUSE product um, called SCF or SUSE Cloud Foundry. Um, what SCF was and what it became was kubecf. It's a distribution of Cloud Foundry that is Kubernetes native um, that allows you to enable that Project Arini capability. You could also choose not to. It'll package you know, the, the Diego cells um, and run them as containers so you kind of have this nested containerization happening. But ideally, it will take the Arini configuration, the, the work from Arini, um, and then take some of the, the tooling that the Project Quarks team has been working on and it creates a Kubernetes native distribution or Cloud Foundry. Um, so that's what kubectl is today. Um, they recently hit you know their 1.0 uh, release. Uh, it might seem like you know we just brought it in as a project and quickly moved to 1.0. Um, but the reason that history matters is that this approach has been um, evolving within the context of SUSE, and then and then it became a broader community around it with SCF, um, and now uh, as a you know upstream foundation project called kubectl. I mean, it's got that that long history behind it. It's an incubation stage. Uh, how different is you know the the evolution? I mean, of the project at Cloud Foundry, where you know you have incubation. Then what are the other stages, and how the, how do you foresee the project to evolve? And do you have any timeline for that? So the first first is within the Cloud Foundry Foundation, we have a very simple project life cycle. Um, when a project enters, it's generally an incubating project. Um, it, it can then graduate to active status. Um, and then when that code base has served its useful life um, within the context of our, you know, our, our community's efforts, uh, it can move to the attic, right? And we're, we're, we, we move projects through that life cycle on a fairly regular basis um, all the way through because uh, we're always evolving our architecture. Um, the difference between incubation and active really, it, it comes down to... Um, signaling to the broader ecosystem that something is not just production ready code, but there's enough commercialization activity um, and enough uh, diverse interest involved in the project that it's something that they can, you know, they can rely on if they're um, more risk adverse, right? So if we look at, if we look at kubectl and think about its status as an incubating project, it's not a judgment of the code itself because again, it had one, it has a history. Two, it has uh, you know a number of um, a couple of the distributions are already commercializing based on it, um, and so it's it's going to fairly quickly kind of reach the point where it's it's actively um, being used by many of the distributions. Now, what what's the future of kubectl? Well, right now we can look at it as the um, uh, the the easiest path to a Kubernetes native Cloud Foundry um, for pure open source users. There are some other efforts um, that are happening in parallel that are taking a look at the each component of the Cloud Foundry architecture. Let's just, I'll give you an example that's fairly simple. Um, you know, the, the logging and metrics pipeline component of that architecture. And they're reevaluating a lot of the, the design decisions that were made in a, in a VM-centric world and saying, you know, are there more kind of Kubernetes idiomatic ways that we can deliver the same capability. Um, and so there's a, there's a collection of, um, of design patterns that are being built. Um, and all of the projects that make up our architecture are going through this, this learning process to make sure that they can reassess some of those assumptions they made. And what that's doing is it's leading us towards this place where each each component is evolving and the work that uh, kubectl has to do um, or some of the things that have been, you know, the, the logic to create that kubectl process, like the fizzle project from, from Quarks. Um, a lot of the, the work there is, is going to become unnecessary. And that's, that's kind of by design, right? So we have these, these two convergent paths where as the project teams re-architect, the, they're simplified um, for ease of, you know, deployment to Kubernetes. And the kubectl code base can actually reduce in its complexity um, and so we have this, these converging things that are going to come together, um, ideally come together in a way that um, lets someone today take kubectl, deploy, to, uh, deploy the whole system to Kubernetes, um, and then they get to take advantage of the simplicity that, that gets enabled as the project teams modify their code. And since it's a, it's a distribution, which also means a lot of you know 
members of the ecosystem, platform ecosystem, they can take it and you know package it or integrate it with their own offering. So there are two questions. Number one is how do you see the ecosystem grow? Second is that how do you ensure that it kind of remain kind of compliant so that you know one distribution is not totally different from other distribution? Yeah. So, so there's a couple things there. Um, when I describe it as is a uh, Kubernetes distribution, the you know, an argument would be made that, well, why, you know, why is the upstream providing a distribution? Um, one of the strengths of the, the way the Cloud Foundry community operates is that we've always offered a, a distribution. Um, and so there's still, there still is a distribution called, uh, called CF deployment um, that's, that's based on a VM-centric architecture that uses the Cloud Foundry Bosch platform to orchestrate um, infrastructure as a service environments or, or you know, virtualized environments like vSphere in order to deploy VMs and then you know, run the system on top of it. Now, that's, that's going to be super important uh, for a long time, right? Because there's, there's a huge number of deployments of CF that, of course, they're, they're predominantly virtual machine-based. Um, so kubectl is kind of the you know the, the way to look at it in a in a Kubernetes infrastructure world. It's intended to do the same thing that the the VM centric distro does, uh, which is it's, it's a starting point for commercialization. Now the second part of your question is how do we um, get consistency across the distros? Well, between both the uh, the CF deployment VM centric distro as well as kubectl. Um, the commonality there is that it's it's the components that they're sewing together create the Cloud Foundry platform, and our certification continues to be based on as it has for um, nearly five years now. Um, continues to be based on the idea that a certified distribution uses those components in an unmodified way and puts them together to to create that developer experience. So irregardless of whether you're deploying the Kubernetes or you're um, deploying the virtual machines, um, irregardless of the, the certified vendor that you use or if you use the upstream distributions, um, you should have that same developer experience available you know, to those developers. So that, that's what our certifications focused on. Um, now, each one of those approaches and all of the commercial distributions operate potentially very differently. Um, Operational consistency is less a concern for our, our ecosystem and our community because many of these providers are offering it as a service. Some of you know those that do it as a uh, you know a subscription-based software delivery, um, they have a lot of tooling around operations that's specific to them, plus all of the other you know value that they bring together. Um, and and so CF really fits into if you think about the commercial distributions. It fits into a bigger product or a bigger platform. Um, and so what we really needed to focus on for, for certification and we continue to focus on is, is that developer experience of the core Cloud Foundry capability consistent between the districts. And what does it mean for a big vendor like SUSE or SAP? And also uh, there are the other members of the Cloud Foundry ecosystem like Anynize or StarkBain who are like also offering uh, offer consultancy. I think the main thing that the kubectl distribution is going to open up for the ecosystem is it, it's going to make the conversations that, um, uh, that that many of them have around, you know, do I use Kubernetes or do I use Cloud Foundry? I mean, it's always kind of been a yeah, answer should have been you use both. But that answer becomes a little bit easier because not only do you use both, but the architecture kind of fits one on top of the other very nicely. And that means that not only is it simpler from a, uh, you know, concern about, you know, dueling stacks, even though the, the use cases are complementary, um, that, that concern of dueling stacks goes away as you layer the two on top of each other. Also, uh, as I've been like monitoring Cloud Foundry for a very long time, uh, also the work that you have been doing with Kubernetes, uh, is like kubectl like final iteration or we will continue to see the evolution of uh, how Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes are working together? And the funny thing is that you both are part of the same family, you know, <laughs> Linux Foundation, CNCF and Cloud Foundry. Yeah, well, you know, the main thing is that um, first, uh, you know, the, the, nothing's ever done, right? So, so, We've we've got I've, I've been involved in Cloud Foundry since the foundation started back in early 2015. Um, the community has a, a few things that it uses as kind of its guiding lights, right? Guiding principles. Um, the first one, and th this is very clear right now, is that we've completely reconverged as an ecosystem around, um, you know, embracing the Kubernetes-based infrastructure as being the um, you know most most popular and rising you know infrastructure approach. 
Um, so we believe that Cloud Foundry offers an enormous amount of value um, to enterprises that are trying to do to you know both deal with container centric infrastructure management and developer productivity, right? So we can bring this two together. So we're we're focused on de- bringing developer productivity to the Kubernetes based infrastructure platforms. But the second thing is that evolution is just kind of in our it's in our nature, right? We've been evolving this architecture as a community for for years now. Um, generally, the CF community has taken an approach that it, it builds what's needed to deliver on its first mission, developer productivity, if nothing else is available. And as other open source communities stand themselves up, mature their software, um, and, and reach the point that you know, the, these mission critical applications that rely on Cloud Foundry um, can also rely on them. They get brought into the architecture and we get to retire code that, that our community n- no longer has to maintain. Um, and I think the last point that I'd make, you know, kind of reference the, yeah, I mean, we're, um, we're, we're all part of the broader Linux Foundation family. Um, more importantly, though, the technical uh, community has a massive amount of overlap. Right. You know, if you think about the engineering teams that are supporting uh, Kubernetes, right, let's let's just talk about VMware as, as one example. Um, VMware has an enormous investment in Kubernetes and that's, they continue to increase that investment. Um, you know, the amount of people they have working on it, the amount of commercialization activity around it. Um, but VMware also has a, now a huge amount with the acquisition of Pivotal, huge amount of investment in Cloud Foundry, which they're continuing and actually ramping up because this mission of bringing the two together is exactly in line with what, what they're looking to achieve. Now, we see the same thing with SAP, with IBM, with SUSE. Um, so that, that big overlap um, presents a lot of opportunities for for everybody. Uh, so Chip, you know, you have been involved with open source for so long. Uh, open source is mostly done remotely, you know, everybody, you know, from Linux all the way to... What do you think will be the impact of this crisis on the industry that they will realize that, you know, we have been like de- kind of developing this code remotely already. So what, what is your like high level overview or, or, or about, you know, uh, what we will learn, how we'll benefit, how we'll turn and, you know, uh, make it a kind of, you know, just a default process that, hey, this is how software is developed. So I think a couple things. One, this is not your average work from home environment right um a lot of the lessons that uh that apply to you know people working from home in in the past um they do apply today but i think there's just honestly you know added added pressure and stress so so if we if we step aside from the the stress that's happening right now and instead you know kind of step back and say well what's the you know, what's the long-term impact of a lot of companies who, in, in software producing companies, who may not as, uh, have been as remote friendly, um, you know, wh- how are they going to, what are they going to learn from this process? Well, you know, the first thing is, you know, right now, everybody should expect productivity hits, right? It's just a, just a reality. People are distracted. Um, but, but once, you know, once the mechanisms start getting in place for everybody that, you know, hasn't built software as part of a remote team, you know, they're learning how to do paired programming remotely. Um, those, those lessons are valuable because it, I think it improves our ability to not just manage remote teams and manage being part of a remote team, but also to deal with the distributed nature of where, where great talent is, right? Um, you know, you, it, it's not necessary to consolidate everyone in the same physical office. There are certainly optimizations there, um, but collaboration between teams in Europe and teams in the United States or teams in, uh, you know, in India and teams in China, right? This is something that we, we're just going to get better at now. Um, so that, that's my take. Awesome. Uh, Chip, thank you so much for taking your time out and talking about uh, QCF. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at some point uh, in person. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it, Sonal. I hope you stay safe and, uh, you know, we, we're going to continue to keep producing great software for everybody. Uh-huh.